So a very warm welcome everyone to the um, second uh, session of the ARDI book talk um, on the ARDI news publication and the global development book series, which is entitled Building Development Studies for the New Millennium. Um, the aim of this volume is to discuss what are development studies as a discipline and as a field. Um, what, how do we study and how do we do research on development, about development, or for development. Maybe um, a few words on the EADI. EADI stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes and is a Europe-wide uh, network of institutes, of researchers and students, all in the various disciplines of development studies. Um, and what we as an association do is to organize activities um, and offer facilities for researchers to exchange, to connect, um, to share knowledge and experiences. So, but without um, much further ado, I would um, like to introduce today's speakers, um, two authors of the chapter Engaged Excellence um, that is included in the, in the volume. Um, and um, they've taken the time to, to join us this afternoon. First of all, a warm welcome to Melissa Leach, who is the Director of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. She has founded um, and directed the ESRC STEPS Centre um, until 2014. And her research um, in Africa and beyond links environment, agriculture, health, technology and gender um, with obviously also interests in, in knowledge, power, citizen en engagement, science and policy, so broad, broad range. John Gaventa is Professor and Director of Research at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of um, and he's been Research Fellow at IDS since 1996. He has also served, among many other positions, as the Director of Development Research as, as the Director of Development of Research Center on Citizen uh, Participation and Accountability, among many other positions. His research focuses on uh, civic learning, citizen participation, um, and engaged research. And um, Melissa and John are today taking on the question of how we, as development study scholars, um, can do research that is engaged with society and not not detach from it, how we negotiate the dilemma whether development studies uh, should be instrumental and applied, or scholarly and critical, or maybe both at the same time. So um, John and Melissa, we look forward to your talk. It's lovely to join you all and we're looking forward to a good discussion about this question of how we can do research that is excellent both as research and excellent in its engagement. How do we genuinely do research, do development studies, build the development studies <clears throat> that is properly engaged with society? So what we want to do is share with you some of the reasons why at IDS we come to think that is so important um, and some of the opportunities it brings, but also some of the challenges. And we want to talk quite honestly about those <clears throat> and then hopefully we can open up the discussion more than with you. I should add that there's a missing author here, a missing presenter who is Katie Oswald who has been part one of the architects of the Engage Excellence Approach at IDS and a co-author of the, the chapter in the ARD book. So she's sorry she can't be with you, but we're carrying the, the mantle for her as well. So to begin a little bit, I think part of the context in which we're thinking about the need for engaged excellence is the context of what development studies now means. Um, it means dealing with highly complex, often highly global challenges in a world that is itself complex and rapidly changing. So whether we're thinking about questions around dealing with inequality and poverty, questions of insecurity and migration, new challenges in urban spaces, those linked to climate change or in the field of global health, epidemics, antimicrobial resistance, we're often in situations where there are important uncertainties as well as risks at stake. We're dealing with the interactions often between short-term shocks and longer-term stresses. Many interactions across scales, linking the local and the global. There are multiple dimensions, some are technical, but many of them are social, economic and political. And power relations of many kinds pervade these. 
And this is a broad agenda that is, of course, embraced um, in some of the big policy frameworks of our time, Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, the realization that those are not silos but need to be addressed through their interconnections, building the synergies, looking at the tensions and trade-offs, looking for some of those key principles like leaving no one behind. Finding transformational pathways which can deliver progressive change for everybody everywhere, which is one definition of development, but also involve engaging sometimes critically with policy and practice in order to build those sometimes alternative pathways. So if that's something about what development is now about these days, and it's also about many other things which we can discuss, what kind of development studies do we now need? Now, I think development studies has always been focused on problems and challenges. That's been part of the hallmark of this, this field of study. Um, it's also always had a normative dimension. Development is not just about studying the world, it's also about seeking to influence it, seeking good change, which to cite Robert Chambers, one of our scholars here, is another basic definition of development. Um, I think there are some other demands of development studies, which, which this field of study has always been quite good at rising to, that has to stay attuned to. Being relevant, um, and these days showing its relevance in a world that is sometimes being described as post-truth, although that in itself is quite a problematic nomenclature, but certainly a world which is more inclined to be skeptical about evidence and about expertise. I think in current times, development studies has to be really alert to the global dimension of what we're doing, yet has to stay true to that all important people dimension, the focus on people and places in all their variety and diversity. And all of this can be served well, I think, by being interdisciplinary. And these days, there's so much talk of bringing together different disciplines, whether one's doing it in a way that's that's multidisciplinary or genuinely trying to integrate, and of bringing the social sciences and the disciplines that have usually been part of development studies, politics, economics, anthropology, sociology, together with natural sciences. So there's a lot of debate about all of this, but I think the area where there's perhaps most um, learning to do is actually in this final kind of um, requirement about being transdisciplinary. And this is where engaged excellence really comes in. Um, transdisciplinarity um, can be broadly defined as research that involves um, actors who are non-academic, actors in society, and actually brings those who are part of policy, practice, the communities, the beneficiaries we work with, into engagement as part of the research process. And I think the, the engaged excellence ideas probably have their greatest novelty um, for development studies in this particular area. So that's part of what we'll focus on this afternoon. So what is engaged excellence? Um, it can seem like a bit of a buzzword, and we're very well aware of that. And I think John and I, when we talked about this concept, often do have to do so with a bit of humility. Um, we don't want to, we, we don't just want to create a new buzzword and the idea of putting excellence in the, the title of what one does can seem a bit kind of arrogant in a way. But what we're actually talking about is something quite simple. It really means that, that we're judging and assessing the quality of our work by how well it engages with others. And those others for us at IBS include parliaments, international agencies, those in civil society, in communities, in businesses, in governments. And as a word and a term, um, this first came into IDS's vocabulary um, around 2015 when we developed and launched our current strategic framework, which is called Engaged Excellence for Global Development. Um, and we've um, worked quite hard to kind of articulate what it means for our own practice and to, to discuss it with others. Um, and we've been talking about four particular pillars that all add up to engaged excellence, and they're all dependent on each other. So if one falls one away, the others all fall down as well. And the four pillars, which we'll be talking about in more detail in a little while, are first of all, delivering high quality research. 
but then co-constructing that knowledge with others, that's the green pillar, the light green one, then mobilizing evidence to make sure it really makes a difference and has impact, and then doing all of that through and with and by building enduring partnerships. Um, we produced an IBS bulletin with some examples of engaged excellence in 2016. Um, and there's a reference at the end of this um, talk to that and to some working papers which also explain the concept. But if that's the way IBS has been thinking about engaged excellence, um, it's not just us and it's not that new. Um, because actually these ideas have much longer intellectual roots and much longer and wider arguments for why they're important, which actually are not just confined to the field of development studies. Um, and in the chapter for the Aragi book, we talk about three particular sets of historical roots and arguments. So the first is epistemological. It's about thoughts and ideas. And here, engaged excellence has a lot of affinities with fields of work around the sociology of scientific knowledge and particularly feminist critiques of science, which in different ways have suggested that knowledge is not just an objective way of looking at a blank slate in some neutral way in the world. The way we produce and describe and interpret knowledge about the world always depends on who we are, always depends on our social position, um, and our position in social relationships, our backgrounds, our education, our training, our own particular biases, our politics, our, our sociality. Um, some people have talked about this, particularly feminist scholars, Donna Haraway, um, Sandra Harding and others, in terms of ideas about situated knowledge, um, to say that the perspectives we bring to bear on the world are always a product of our own situations of our own standpoints. And they've gone further to say that because all standpoints are not equal, we need to think and act really seriously to bring in plurality and to recognize that um, there are always plural, partial perspectives on, on the world. Um, that in turn gives one a rather different view of objectivity, as Donna Harrow puts it. True objectivity doesn't lie in producing a kind of God trick, as she would argue, where you look at the world and say, this is the truth about it. It actually lies in being explicit about the partial perspective that you bring and being open to the partial perspectives that others bring. And objectivity then comes from building that richer picture from those multiple plural partial perspectives. Another way of thinking about and well, slightly similar, but building on this, comes from another strand of the sociology of scientific knowledge, which says that actually we can never escape this because knowledge is always produced at the same time as social and political orders. There is no such thing as taking science or research and doing it in a neutral way outside of society. Even the most hardline tech scientists or epidemiologists or microbiologists can't escape their positions as social actors. Um, and it's actually through making identities, institutions, discourses, representing things that knowledge gets produced and society gets produced at the same time. And this in turn, if we take any of these um, issues seriously, it means that knowledge is always political. And so engaged excellence and development studies must involve um, articulating, unpacking, analysing and then engaging with the politics of knowledge. So if those are some epistemological arguments, which might seem a little bit arcane, they actually interact with some much more pragmatic ones, which really say, if we're dealing with the kinds of problems that, that development is, is addressing, um, academic knowledge alone isn't enough. We have to make sure that, um, that we're producing knowledge in a way that actually apprehends realities and sometimes people who are not academics, either because they're living those everyday realities or because they're deeply embedded in politics and policy processes, have to be part of the research. They're part of that revealing of complexity, of the analysis, of the knowledge generation. Um, 
We can also add to the pragmatic arguments that the knowledge we produce only becomes relevant and salient if it involves those so-called users of research, whether those are people in communities, and this has been, of course, the argument of work in participatory research traditionally, or work on indigenous knowledge, for instance, um, or indeed relevant and salient to policymakers and practitioners. Um, because if you design and co-develop research with them, um, they're going to have, that they, your one's going to be asking questions and producing knowledge that is more salient to them. Um, there's also an argument about credibility, that um, engaged, engaged knowledge, that um, engaged excellence becomes more credible by involving users within it. And then there are quite practical arguments about impact, which is something that as researchers we increasingly have to attend to, whether it's through the demands of our funders, whether it's through the demands of our, our universities and assessment frameworks, or because actually um, we want to have and, uh, and make a difference to our development studies. And we can think about impact as instrumental, making quite direct differences, practical changes on the ground, we can also think about impact as being more conceptual, as changing ideas over the longer term, or as coming through capacity building with others. And all of these are better achieved, um, so the pragmatic argument would go, by involving non-academic actors, engaging with them through the research process. And then thirdly, um, these two arguments link to a third set, which again has deep roots, in streams of, of social science um, within and beyond development, which are much more normative. Now, I started by saying development studies has always been a normative field of studies, um, where actually the imperative for engagement is also a moral imperative. It's a moral imperative about making a difference. It's often linked also to moral ideas about democratization and about justice. Justice, not just in material terms, dealing with um, things like social and economic inequalities, but also what we can think about as trying to overcome knowledge inequalities, or what scholars like Javishnavathan would call cognitive justice. How can we actually build ways of knowing that are more attentive and more equally attentive to diverse ways of knowing and being in the world, and actually try to overcome some of the biases which have seen valid knowledge as being produced by dominant groups in society, or by the North as opposed to the South, or by elites as opposed to people living in various forms of, of marginalization. So um, the normative argument here is very much about overcoming marginalization, enabling voice and contributions to knowledge from the people who might otherwise be excluded from centers of power overcoming social and political marginalization through bringing people's knowledges into research and its implications. And this in turn um, leads to arguments about the need to take into account not just plural knowledges, but also the plural ways in which they're expressed, going beyond formal science very often to recognizing experiential knowledge, going beyond official expertise to recognizing everyday expertise, and going beyond knowledge that's only articulated in words and numbers to forms of knowing and gaining knowledge and expressing it that might be visual or more aesthetic or more dealt with through everyday sensory perceptions or physicality or emotion rather than simply those kind of post-enlightenment scientific ways of knowing and being. And Two streams of work that have really taken all of this quite seriously um, would be participatory action research, important in development studies, but also beyond it, or the big body of work on community university partnerships. And we refer in the chapter particularly to Rajesh Tandon's work here in India and beyond. And then finally, I think these normative arguments and the arguments about cognitive justice connect up with the recent, um, more recent debates about decolonizing development studies and decolonizing academia more broadly, making sure that the voices, the perspectives, the 
the academic traditions which come from diverse parts of the world um, and which are the products of certain kinds of power relations then have a role in beginning to overturn those power relations to something that is a more just set of forms of knowledge. So um, if those are some, as it were, kind of arguments for why engaged excellence is important, let's turn now to some of the pillars and how one can do it in practice. Great, thank you, Melissa, and thanks everyone for joining us. So as you recall, Melissa talked about these four pillars of engaged excellence, high quality research, co-construction, mobilizing knowledge, and enduring partnerships. And oftentimes, historically, we found a tension between excellence in research and excellence in these other three. There's always been this sort of bias that if you start involving people or worrying too much about impact or working with others, that somehow you will dilute the excellence of the research itself. Yeah. And I think our perspective is trying to challenge that dichotomy. It's saying you actually get really good research when you involve others yeah. and when you work with partners, et cetera. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's still bound by some of the same traditional concepts about research. We use rigorous methods, and we have ways of understanding rigor across mixed methods and very diverse methods within development studies, quantitative, qualitative, participatory, reflective. And we have moved from development studies has always thought about itself as a multidisciplinary approach. Increasingly, it's moved to an interdisciplinary approach, moving beyond how each single discipline looks at a common problem to really trying to integrate those frameworks and approaches. And then as Melissa said earlier, moving beyond that from the academy to think about transdisciplinary of working with stakeholders um, who are directly affected in multiple ways and have multiple forms of knowledge. So we still strive for that high quality research, but we also want to reflect in all of this that we're learning despite our commitment to this, that you know, this is hard work. There's challenges, and I'm sure many of you will understand some of them. One is how do we do this in difficult contexts? Um, I am now currently leading a program on empowerment and accountability in fragile conflicts settings where research space as well as civic space is closing very, very rapidly. And we've had to adapt on the fly, coming up with new ways of doing research that aren't what we might traditionally think about just to protect the safety and security of those involved. We have to bridge differences of concepts, assumptions, and language. And even though we think we can easily bring everybody together to get this rich interdisciplinary framework, that's hard because we have deeply entrenched in our own ways of approaching a problem and, and talking about it. Within the academy itself, there's a history of sort of disciplinary hierarchies and power relations. Some think their discipline is the most important and others are subservient. And when we extend that to the, the broader world, of course, the long power relationships between formal expertise and experiential knowledge um, are, are still widely pervasive. And even though we might aspire towards interdisciplinarity, we find that that's not always our, our career incentives or funding incentives don't actually help us to do this. Now, Melissa, we're going to sh share some examples. I'm just wondering in terms of time, should we just keep going or Give one example, and then yeah, I'll keep yeah, going, and yeah. later you can come back yeah, if that's yeah, up. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah. So a very, a very relevant example here. Um, I finished a year ago leading a project called Dynamic Drivers of Disease in Africa, which brought together 19 partners um, to look at uh, disease transmission processes and ecology and society. Um, some were environmental scientists, some were medical scientists, and some were social scientists. And we struggled enormously to bridge each other's concepts and practices. We had an interesting subversion of the normal hierarchies where medicine sits on top because this was actually a social science-led program. Um, and we found that the, the best way to do it was to work together in the field where we actually found that confronted with a real problem of how rats were transmitting Lassa fever to women gardeners in Sierra Leone, people could come together and actually get out of those hierarchies and, and pool their knowledge around a common concept. But it was all too easy then for people to go back to their universities and sit back into their silos and feel that what they should be doing was writing papers that spoke to their own communities. So it was a very interesting experience for me in both 
the opportunities to be gained by really overcoming those hierarchies and doing this just kind of disciplinary work in practice. But actually also the difficulties of sustaining it beyond the immediate situation of interaction. So there's challenges on the research process itself, right? Yeah. But then when you try to take that to the next pillar of co-constructing knowledge, not simply amongst the those of different disciplines, but with local community members, practitioners, policymakers, government staff, who themselves are highly diverse. None of these groupings are, are themselves homogeneous. There are also big challenges. Now, a lot of times when we talk about co-constructing knowledge, oftentimes that simply refers to the research process in the field where different groups interact. Yeah. But really, co-construction is about starting with the question of whose question is important in the first place. And how do you frame it? Where does the problem come from? How do you co-collect the data? How do you co-analyze it? Um, who brings, who does the, synth bringing syntheses together is a powerful process. Who's involved in that? Who communicates? And each of these questions of, of, of co-creation relates back to Melissa's arguments about cognitive justice and how we also achieve impact. So again, the goal here is important. I think we understand it, but the, the challenges are real. Um, building trust amongst multiple stakeholders takes time, it takes patience. All of us, we work with divided hierarchies of knowledge, but also divided social relations, and those power relations don't stay outside the room when you bring people together. They come into the room, and we need to learn to navigate those power relations. Many of us as researchers were changed, trained in research skills, but really this takes processes of communication and facilitation and reflective and dialogical skills that we oftentimes weren't taught in our research 101 courses. And even though we say we want to build co-construction from the beginning, many times we, we find we, funding doesn't allow us to do it, that we actually have to write the proposal to get the funds where we then go out and start cons consulting and meeting with, with the stakeholders. Now again, to give an example though, we're beginning to see that terrain shift. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the UK with some of the recent uh, Global Challenges Research Fund calls, they, the donors themselves are beginning to recognize the importance of, of co-construction with partners from the beginning. And for instance, we're involved in a very big consortium involving several dozen partners, UK academics, Southern academics, around risk and resilience in urban areas um, in Nairobi in particular, our pieces in Nairobi in particular. And the donor there has allowed us to say the first two years of the research, that's 18 months to two years, will be spent simply listening to and meeting with the various stakeholders, the government officials, the planning authorities, the communities, out of which will emerge the most important questions. So that's really innovative, I think, and positive to think that, that we can turn research around by not starting with the question that the researcher and the donor thinks is most important, but by starting with the framework and really then listening to people about how you should do that, um, how what questions and specific questions emerge from it. Then you bring to this the whole challenge of, of mobilizing evidence. And like Melissa said, oftentimes in a more traditional research framework, you think about researchers or scientists producing truths or evidence which then down the road are communicated after publication to the public who then takes action. It's a very linear kind of process. But the minute you start co-producing with multiple partners and recognizing different forms of knowledge, the process of mobilizing evidence uh, also occurs. And the ways in which we affect impact aren't simply about informing policy and practice, which is what's often measured. It's about changing discourses. It's about changing, shifting concepts. It's about shifting values and norms throughout the research process, not simply at, at the end. And some of the most, we've reflected at IDS, we think some of the most important contributions we've made over time are where you could point immediately to a real-time impact on a policy, but actually where we've shifted the narrative about how you understand a particular problem, or how do you conceptualize and frame power or sustainability. And we need to recognize these multiple ways into impact, um, and using multiple methods increasingly these days. It's not simply the written word, it's, it's the visual, it's multimedia. 
and recognize also that if we're about co-constructing, who decides the impact that's the most important also needs to be co-constructing. Mm -hmm. But again, doing that sounds nice, but it's difficult. Uh, we know that policy processes are, are, are very, very challenging. Um, they're, they're political. It's not simply a matter of informing policy makers because they themselves are in power struggles. We know we're increasingly finding that the time and capacity to engage this decision makers for their time and capacity. So I'm involved in running a five million pound research fund that's producing all kinds of evidence, but we were told recently that we that the, the donors who are one of our targets simply didn't have time to even click on a short summary of that research. And, and, and how do we match their demands and their ability to learn with the need for evidence? And then like Melissa said, in this kind of world of post-truth politics, that there's skepticism anyway about expertise yeah. and anything yeah. that we can produce as evidence can easily be discredited as saying, well, that's simply irrelevant or wrong expertise. And we have to learn to navigate the, this, this new politics of, of what knowledge is and whose knowledge is, is most important. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going, you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to give a, another interesting yeah. example, but we can come back to that in, yeah. in, in, in discussion. And, and finally, we bring to all of this, of course, the idea of this, all three of these pillars are underpinned by the notion of building and direct partnerships. At IDS, we realize that, that we simply can't, as a northern based institution with a large number of researchers, but we can't do any of these things without working with others. And about half of our research funding actually flows through us to engage with partners around the world. And bringing partners involved um, along the lines that Melissa argued brings diverse forms of knowledge and skills and capabilities. It ensures that we're getting multiple knowledges from the local and the na national context. Um, it, it, there's normative reasons to do so in terms of cognitive justice. There's pragmatic arguments because we learn together. We bring different pieces of the pie. We strengthen our capacities mutually. We might understand, we might think we know how to do research in one setting, but only by engaging with a partner where we understand what that really means in their setting and how to navigate that local terrain. But again, in trying to build this normative idea of enduring partnerships, that they, they're huge challenges. Um, we know that they're, again, in the power relations embedded in different ways of knowing. Um, these are oftentimes reinforced by funding relationships. So one of the challenges we constantly find is we are asked to bring people in as equal partners, and yet at the same time, we are seen as the lead contractor and have ultimate responsibilities for accountability and, are, and end up in our contracts of passing money and doing due diligence and all that, we're treating people like subcontractors, but intellectually we're trying to say that you are real partners with us. But that's the only, that's the way that the funding relationship um, sort of manages accountability. Um, there's long practices of global divisions of intellectual labor that we have to overcome. Well, oftentimes in the past, the, the South has been doing the field work, the North has been doing the global or comparative synthesis. And even if we want to just say that we want to do it differently, it's, it's not easy because we all have different skills and capabilities that have been learned and built um, over time. And then all of this trust is absolutely key. Um, in my many years now of managing complex partnerships, um, I found that building trust is, is critical. And building trust can best be done by being communicating, 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 and being absolutely open on things like funding and, and division of labor and, 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 and division of budgets, things that oftentimes can be a bit sensitive. I remember one very difficult meeting early on in a partnership. Uh, it was only when we said, here's made that the budget 100% transparent, including our very high rates compared to other rates, and we could really talk through the, the kind of, in a very open way, the political economy in partnerships. Um, becomes critical. But if we're continuing to learn a huge amount in this, and I would refer people to a, a new publication um, called Understanding and Improving Fair and Equitable Research Partnerships, which has just been published in the, the, in the UK. 
by Jude Franzman. Jude yeah. Franzman. I can send the link out to uh, yeah. Julia if there's a way to do this. But I think we've learned a, a huge amount now in the last five, ten years um, of what it really means to, to build partnerships. But just to reiterate, as Melissa said at the beginning, these four challenges link with each other. Um, and if you take one away, these four pillars, you take one away, the other folds. You can't really do the kind of engaged research without having multiple forms of knowledge, which are brought by having different partners. You can't really have impact, we think, and mobilize again without respecting the multiple forms of knowledge and, 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 and diversity of experience and the diverse ways to communicate it, et cetera. So the challenge is how we bring to, to our disciplinary, to studies, an intertwined approach here of engaged excellence. And that's when we think research can be truly com compared, to truly uh, transformative. Right. So we'd love to hear from you, your comments, your questions. Just to say that we have, uh, this builds on in addition to the, the chapter in the excellent book that EID has produced. It builds on this IDF bulletin that Melissa referred to. That's open access, and the link is there on the slide. It's the January 2017, or actually December 2016, mindset oh, okay. volume. Um, and a longer research paper that's on our website again um, that looks at those intellectual traditions that Melissa covered, done by our colleague Katie Oswald. But we'd love to hear your, your experiences and, and your thoughts. Thanks, Melissa and John. Thanks, you. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. And I think, John, you already picked up on, on one of the biggest issues we, when we talk about knowledge production and, and um, um, sharing is the, is the question of open access. Um, so I think it's great that, uh, that at least some of the, the, the work there is, is shared in open access. Um, I think, I re well, I really enjoyed, um, you know, I understand Engaged Excellence somehow maybe as a, as a research program that joins all the different discussions that, that are currently ongoing in academia, as you mentioned, the, the discussion about decolonizing um, development, about the democratization of knowledge, transdisciplinarity, um, the question of who's, you know, who has a legitimate voice who can produce knowledge who can produce research. I think it's it's a really comprehensive research program. Um, yeah, as John said, I would like to invite everyone now to, to comment, to ask questions, um, discuss. Um, please, as I said, um, indicate in the chat box um, that you want to um, say something so we can keep track a little bit so no one gets overlooked. Um, I maybe just give you a few moments to, to think and start off with the first question. Um, because I, well, I noticed that um, you mentioned um, um, collaboration with different stakeholders. And um, mostly, but mostly you referred to obviously the local communities, um, policy makers, um, but you didn't mention, or maybe I missed that you didn't mention collaboration with um, the corporate world, businesses, companies, etc. So I wondered, you know, whether maybe you have any examples, whether you have any views on that, because I recently had discussions with, with colleagues saying, well, it's very difficult to build these these collaborations to build these relationships of, of co-production in, in research context because usually either the companies have even less time than the policymakers or they rather do the research themselves and are not as much interested in connecting to the academic world. So maybe that. And um, yeah, in the meantime, um, I would ask everyone to please feel free to um, join in the discussion. So shall I say something quickly about the while people are thinking of their questions? Um, engaging with corporate actors is a is is a very key part of what we try to do. Although I have to say, I guess has probably done it less than engagement with some of the, some of the other actors. But we have a cluster on business markets in the state that is very much about working with businesses, um, not just large players, but also small and medium sized enterprises in low and middle income countries to get involved in co-produced research. And I think one of the nice examples that we've had has been with a big corporation with, with Sainsbury's, um, which has a foundation 
which um, we, with whom we've worked to develop ideas about fair trade in value chains and about mm -hmm. about workers' rights and about sustainability practices. And we worked with them on a, a pilot around tea production, helping them to ask answer questions that they had about how they could ensure that their, their supply chain practices were, were equitable and were supporting local rights and were, were sustainable. Um, and that's been a very nice example of a collaboration mm -hmm. which has felt like a proper partnership, but I do agree that very often it's, it's, it's the other way around and one gets some of those pressures of working with policymakers magnified even more um, because of the power relations and the, the vested interests and the time availability. From, from private sector actors. But I think it's something we really can't avoid. But partly because more and more development is now being delivered with, with the private sector. And so increasingly, I think co-construction will need to be with private sector actors. And I think if I can just add to that, of course, it immediately relates to your question, Julia, about knowledge and, and open access. Yeah, and yeah. We always would like to think that people were doing research, even with private actors, that were doing it for the global good. Mm -hmm. And using that as a test is, is important. And particularly in this day, when we talk about private sector in knowledge production, we see the huge growth of large consulting companies who are bidding in the same areas and winning contracts. Um, and one of the big challenges is that a lot of the knowledge produced through the private consultancies on important development problems may not always be public, even though it's paid for by public taxpayers' money. Yeah. And we think a an important um, starting point or basic principle is if, if this research is funded by the for the by the public, it should be for the public good, and we need to resist the privatization of knowledge, yeah. which which seems to be occurring. Yeah. Are there already any questions? Oh, by the chat. One yeah, don't be shy. Please <laughs> unmute yourself, or you can just also type maybe in the chat box if you don't want to. Is there one in the chat box? There seems to be a number one from what we can see. Was that you, Magenda, who came on? Yes. Okay, oh, so somebody said they're interested in more about the tea production article. Um, it yeah, it's possible to get access. So um, I can inquire. This was um, a colleague, Gil Tom, who did this work. I think there's a working. I think there's probably an IDS working paper, but um, we can we can share it. I will look into that particular particular resource. Otherwise, you could directly contact our researcher because some of this work is ongoing, and it's Gil Tom, G I E L T O M. And his email address would be g.tom at ibs.ac.uk. I would also be happy to, if you send, uh, send the article to me also to share it with, yeah. with everyone. So, yeah. Yeah. But, okay. Um, maybe another, I was wondering um, because you. Um, you spoke of co-construction of knowledge rather than of co-production. Is that intentionally or is that, yeah? Okay, um, I think we see, I think there are two reasons for that actually. I think we feel that the idea of co-construction um, has within it a slightly more bottom-up bottom-up feel. Sometimes production can feel a bit kind of linear and then a bit bit like sort of building a building, whereas construction has a sense of it being a little bit more organic. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of touchy-feely response, I think. The other is that in these debates about in the sociology of science, the term co-production has acquired some very specific meanings. And so this is the work of Sheila Jasanoff particularly at Harvard. Um, who has written a series of books, and the main one is The Co-Production of Science and Social Order, um, where the term co-production is used in a slightly different way. And I mean, I did outline her argument, which is that all knowledge is always produced in conjunction with the production of, of society, as it were. Mm -hmm. And although there are overlaps with the way we're using co-construction in, in I did about engaged excellence, 
it's not quite the same. Um, and I think we were keen to not to get kind of swept up into that, that rather particular um, co-production argument. There's a little bit more detail in the working paper by Katie Oswald, which explores the slightly different origins of those, those debates. Mm -hmm. There was a question by Jessica, um, who is asking for your thoughts on the role of citizen science or citizen generated data in, in this, in the context of this agenda. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about that or should I talk about that? Um, let me talk in general and you, yeah. you pick up yeah, on yeah. the citizen science yeah. particularly. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is really important and, and there's a long history of work on, on citizen science. Melissa can say yeah. that a bit more of that directly related to a lot of it's come out of health and yeah. popular epidemiology or barefoot epidemiology, those yeah. kinds of things. In, in my own work, which started in the rural US, um, it was a real eye opening because I used to be involved in this uh, citizen research program. And, and in the field of toxic waste, we were finding them that medical doctors and scientists coming in and saying, well, there's no connection between the health problems in the community and the chemicals that, yeah. that, that were in the landfill or coming from the factory. But when local women started doing their own, what we call barefoot epidemiology, it, and they combined that with their local knowledge, they came up with the causal connections that then could be tested yeah. uh, because they, they had this ability of data plus experience. And that's a very powerful combination. And I think in my field now, which is more around citizen-led accountability, we see so many ways where citizens are bringing their own data production to hold governments to account. So for instance, at IDS and one of the projects that's highlighted in our IDS bulletin um, is called HANSI, which is a, it's a nutrition monitoring project where citizens monitor the government's data on nutrition in Tanzania and a number of countries. So that's in a way they're, they're, they're doing their own research on extent yeah. to which nutrition is being realized, but that data is then being used to hold the government yeah. to account. Yeah. Yeah. And that's quite a challenge now because many people may know and Tanzania has just recently passed a law in their closing, because it's a country that's rapidly closing, they have recently passed the Government Statistics Act, which makes it illegal for researchers to publish data that challenges government official statistics. Yeah. Um, and so it makes, uh, in that context, uh, citizen science becomes much more difficult. But Melissa, you've worked on this in the area of health. Yeah, yeah, I that. have. I mean, I've worked on citizen science in relation to global health issues and the relationship between health and environment and indeed around environments. And uh, these are all fields where citizen science has been really, really important. So it's, for instance, most, most recently, the example I was going to use around mobilizing knowledge is the work that um, anthropologists at IBS did with local partners in the context of the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa, um, where in the context of absolute failure of, of the international humanitarian and World Health Organization response, because it encountered a lot of social resistance from communities, and failure of um, top-down scientific epidemiology to actually explain why the outbreak and the epidemic was unfolding as it was, um, we became involved in something we called the Epidemic Response Anthropology Platform, which um, engaged local knowledge and academic anthropological knowledge of that region to show what was actually going on in terms of um, the social aspects of transmission, what villagers were doing around funerals and, and burials, both why the epidemic was spreading and what it was in the past relationships of inequality and development interventions in that region, which made people so anxious about this top-down external response. And it was a good example, of, in terms of these pillars, of mobilizing evidence for action in real time, because we were producing very rapid briefings and dialogues and online pieces as the outbreak was unfolding and feeding them in through them through to the humanitarian agencies and the World Health Organization who were responding and altering their practices. So it's an example there. But what came out of it most clearly was that this epidemic was ending because of the practices that villages and communities um, were engaged in as they came to learn about this disease which was previously unknown to them. 
And one of our partners in the platform, Paul Richards, then wrote a book called Ebola, How Citizen Science Helped to End an Epidemic. And his, his argument was that it was actually um, the combination of the experiential knowledge of villagers as they came to learn about, about the Ebola virus and how it transmitted, combined with the epidemiological knowledge that was brought by those outside agencies. And these two came together to create a really powerful citizen science, um, which, which then enables, um, enabled the epidemic to end. So I think the citizen science concept is really valuable. Where I've sometimes critiqued it and written to critique it is that it, it judges citizen knowledge on the basis of formal science and sometimes only deems legitimate forms of knowledge that are actually compatible with science. Whereas if we're really to do engaged excellence and plural knowledge, I think we also have to be open to contestation of academic or scientific knowledge um, by forms of experience which may be different and may be actually incompatible or even at odds with what formal science is, is saying. And then you need to have a debate and a more deliberative approach to bringing the technologies together. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we take Annie's question first. Um, she was asking uh, whether you could share some thoughts on how um, decolonization of knowledge and knowledge production um, be practically achieved. Right. Huge, huge question, right? <laughs> I uh, think so. Uh, Julia, yeah. Julia is one of the great yeah. in our series of video, you, your email yeah. series on this is great. Yeah. I mean, because we have to recognize, of course, that we're fighting history. hundreds of years of history on yeah. this. I think two practical ways that yeah. we've tried to struggle with it here. Um, one is in our curriculum, we have students from master's programs and students here from all over the world who have very appropriately challenged uh, what we include in our syllabi and, and really are we bringing uh, the different, the diversity of views from the South uh, in, in an equal way into our syllabi. That's a challenge to, to be able to throw away those old ones and, and really relook at that. But the other thing that I think is very important is that in, in my own work is not a lot of knowledges have historically been suppressed. And so the process of decolonization, and, and even further than that, Rajesh Tandon and Doug Hall in our, yeah. in our bulletin talk about the, um, the, the pesticide of, of, you know, of killing off of knowledges historically. So yeah. it's, knowledges have been repressed. So part of research can be recovery of, repressed, of, of, yeah. of suppressed knowledges. Yeah. And again, in my, and that could be recovery of indigenous knowledge, it could be recovery of, of local ways of knowing, mm -hmm. recovering them done through oral histories and oral traditions or other kinds of popular artifacts, and then trying to give them some more visibility in the more formal knowledge world. Yeah. But we can't sort of bring into the curricula perspectives if they have long been deliberately suppressed through some sort of power knowledge nexus. We have to go through this recovery and, and rejuvenation process. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, Bushraf can go ahead if, if you're there. Maybe I'll just ask his question. <laughs> yeah. Um, which was, um, he was asking, where should we focus more on evidence or an engagement of policymakers for inclusive policy or practice? So does that? Um, I, I mean, it's a good question. I think our response would be that it's not an either or, <laughs> and that inclusive policy and practice. Um, is best achieved by engaging policymakers in 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 the production and analysis and deliberation on the evidence. So uh, the the I think the, the engaged excellence idea is a bit of a critique of that notion that that sort of linear notion as John was was describing it, whereby researchers sometimes feel that they what they do is produce the evidence and then you 
you hand it over to policymakers. And, and in in some disciplines, there's even a whole discipline called translational research. And medicine has this, where where that's actually you know, the sort of hierarchy. You do the pure science, and then you then you produce the evidence, and then you have your kind of application and trans um, and translation. And then maybe you need to do some research on the systems in order to make that happen, and then you hand it over to policymakers and, and practitioners. And I think engaged excellence questions that whole model and says if we can involve policymakers and practitioners from the very beginning in helping to design the questions and shape the research, then we're likely to end up both with better evidence, better in the sense of, of more salient, more credible, more useful, and also better impact um, because it will already have been kind of taken on board from, from the start and will be more relevant. I think one thing we're, we're learning is that it's only a very rare moment where you produce a written piece of evidence and it happens to land on the policymaker's desk yeah. just at the right moment and they yeah. read it and somehow it changes their actions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are important moments, but they're rare. Yeah. We've begun at IDS doing a lot of what we call learning journeys, which is working with, uh, in this case, donor organizations or others where they come together in a kind of more of a reflective process and frame what is most you, what is it they really need to know now? And then we figure out what kinds of knowledge do we have that we can bring to them on that. But it combines production of written evidence with a more dialogue process and, uh, and process hopefully a bit over time. But again, the challenge is if everybody likes the idea, but the challenges of doing it in practice are very difficult because people are so busy, they have so many competing demands. Um, and it's very hard for them to agree on what they think the most important questions are to be asked in, in the first place. So one can spend endless amounts of time just defining the question around which the learning journey should be organized, um, and rather than getting on with the research. So it's a new way of working, but it, it, there are some challenges yeah. um, with it. Yeah. There's a question here about transdisciplinarity and, and online forms of communication. Should we, should we try and respond to that one? This is not sure who this one Yeah, I think we can still take yeah. that before so, we, we need to wrap up. So just, I mean, just a quick one here. Um, I mean, at IDS, we, we, we were actually quite early in the whole process of creating digital platforms and online modes of communication. Um, and have continued to use digital platforms, webinars, and, and um, forms of online knowledge sharing, often ways of um, packaging up development studies, debates and pieces, and, and using, using digital platforms to disseminate them widely to audiences, as well as to have these more interactive kinds of exchanges on, online. Um, I don't think that's a, that's a fad. I think, to be honest, um, so, so much of our world is now digital by default. Um, I think the question now needs to be not whether, whether the online world is going to go away, but how can we make sure that we're, we're using it in a way that's, genu that's genuinely liberating, promoting freedom, incorporating um, the knowledge of a wide range of plural knowledges, um, overcoming digital inequalities, which mean that some people can access knowledge in this way and others can't because they've got limited bandwidth or internet access. And I think we need to be really careful about some of the other trends that have gone along with, with, with digital media, including surveillance um, of citizen activity and a closing down of the spaces people have to, to express and share their knowledge as well as the dissemination of um, fake news and, and unmediated um, forms of information. So in response to that question, I, I don't think there's a risk in, in, there's a risk of online work being a fad that's going to go away, but I think there are real risks associated with digital communications, which we need to engage critically with and make sure that they're being used in ways that follow some of these other normal, normative and moral imperatives around cognitive justice. If I can pick up on that yeah. too, uh, I think whether it's not, whether it's online or not, exactly. um, yeah. your question is important and an important one because 
even on in-person forms of light consultation may simply feed back public opinion of what people have been taught to think yeah. at the moment rather than what their knowledge would be had they had the chance to really think about it and investigate it. So I oftentimes in my work on participation try to make a difference between popular opinion. You go and ask people, what did you think? Yeah. Um, and they give you what they've been taught to think or a quick off-the-cuff answer, as opposed to an engaged excellence approach where people have had a chance to engage with others through some sort of participatory research to build an informed view based on their own reality. And so it's, it's the difference between uh, knowledge and voice. You can say people had voice, but that voice may be a very superficial form of voice that would be different if they really had a chance to deliberate. And that's why I, I think we constantly, whether it's online or not, need to think about engaged excellence with people to turn opinion into a deeper form of reflective um, knowledge arising from from yeah. investigation on one's own experience. Yeah. Okay. I think we we need to wrap up. So many thanks uh, to Melissa and John uh, for for giving this uh, this talk to us. Um, and I think yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, but I think you provided us uh, with lots of inspiring and interesting starting points. And maybe to come back to, to the question of online access and forms of knowledge sharing, um, because we're aware that the ARD volume is unfortunately not online access. I think this webinar series where we invite the authors of the different chapters to speak about their work and their, um, their, their chapters, will maybe hopefully serve as some kind kind of, of platform to to share this share this knowledge even despite um, the restrictions that are there in terms of publication. So I invite everyone to um, check the ARD website and um, follow the, the webinar series. So we will follow up with um, with more authors of the book. Um, and we will share Melissa and John's uh, slides and the talk so you can actually rewatch it um, and um, have another think about it. So again, many thanks and everyone um, have a great afternoon.